Please welcome Academy Award nominated editor for Silver Linings Playbook, Jake Cassidy, and Academy Award nominated writer, director, David O. Russell. You can sit over here and the... They should sit in the middle. Now you don't want Jamie, they'll go through. Hey, Roger. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. So, always the director. Um, David, it's been 10 years of Silver Linings Playbook since the impact, the legacy of the film. Um, I have had so many people dealing with mental health issues that have come to me and said, this film has made such a big impact on them. Can you tell us what has been for you the feedback you've gotten about the film? Well, first I want to thank you guys for coming out and uh, watching the film. And I want to thank you, Roger, for, for, for your beautiful festival and for inviting us. Oh, thank and, for, and for you've always been such a good friend to us. And this is where cinema lives and loves in Santa Barbara. No, no place better than here. Everybody, this is a You're true very... cinema temple. This is a cinema temple. And Jay and I just rode down here from our editing room where we're editing our new movie. And this was such a treat for me to watch half the movie because I love the picture. You know, and I just haven't watched it in the theater in about 10 years. And um, yeah, it, I just think it plays so good. And it's so f like a time capsule to see Jennifer so young and Bradley so young and uh, Bob. And uh, the film for me was very personal because in my family we've had this. And so I related to Matthew Quick's novel. And Robert also had it in his family and related to it. And Jennifer and Bradley both are gifted with the beautiful craziness themselves. So they understand it. And uh, I've had many people come up to me over the years and be grateful for the removal of the stigma of talking about mental illness. Um, that the fact that you can, you can talk about it openly and you can, you can laugh about it and you can cry about it. And uh, it's been a great bridge to talk to many people uh, about their different issues that they have in their homes. Um, after the film in its success, you were involved with Congress and the Excellence in Mental Health Act, correct? That was a bipartisan bill uh, that was introduced by Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan with a Republican, Blount, bipartisan, to have mental health for health care uh, because it's normally not included. And uh, uh, that Bradley and I went to help introduce the bill, you know, and I, I hope, I don't know if the, everything seems to have been rolled back, but you want everybody to get the treatment they deserve in a nice place, you know? You want your loved ones to be in a place that has a soul, and it's nice, it's not a cold institution. Yeah. Um, Jay, I... <clears throat> Jay, I've seen the film so many times, but recently I watched it again, and I, that first act is so tricky where we could actually be turned off about this character, but we're not. We actually start rooting and falling in love with him. Can you, was it tricky for you to shape that first act of the film? Tricky, yes. <laughs> Care to you tell know, us a little bit? You about? know, you, all of myself, David, and Bradley, who were, Bradley was quite involved in the editing in as he was he had he has kind of a interest in directing as we all know and David was generous enough to include him in the process just as their relationship on the set was very collaborative I wasn't a part of that but he, we, when it carried into the editing room and we you know, we, we had serious questions amongst ourselves about how, how just the degree to which uh, Pat can behave in the first act and not lose the audience. That's, you know, it, as you say, but, and I think one of, I just remember 
one of the big uh, editorial kinds of breakthroughs for us was we restructured the um, uh, Hemingway story. So that was the first night he came home. And that once we did that, somehow you could accept his behavior because it was before the first Dr. Patel scene, or it was after the first Dr. Patel scene. And, and you know, we, but it, it, uh, that move it, as a kind of a, that we kind of evolved to in our experimenting and the editing um, allowed you to uh, accept, uh, a lot of it was Bob's reaction to uh, his son uh, in that uh, episode. And the amazing Jackie Weaver. Oh, oh yes, my yes, God, yes. Yes, yes, right. yes. Yeah, when I introduced the film, I said it's rare in film history that all, the entire cast was nominated for Two years in a row. Yeah, not, to, uh, not, uh, yeah I saying, mentioned that saying, as well, saying, American saying. Hustle. Just saying, just saying. Um, uh, oh, you have a couple of good seasons. You want to remember the good seasons? We did American Hustle and this were back to back. We had all four leads nominated. And they were all fantastic, every single person. Jackie uh, uh, does so much with so little. She just murders you. You know, with your heart, with her heart. David, and I saw the film, and I teach the film to my class, and after, I, I actually seek the book, and you made changes to, from the original story, like um, his mental in, illness was a little more, I mean, stronger in the book. Also, the dad was a lot harsher, a lot, you know, I mean, I'm being kind. It was, he's, he's definitely very harsh character. Can you tell us about the metamorphosis of the, of the story and the changes you made? Well, I was given the galleys of the book in 2007 or eight by Sidney Pollack, the late director, Sidney Pollack, the great and director. Anthony Minghella, correct. And Anthony Minghella, and they both died, which was crazy, like within that year. You know, and they were supposed to help me produce this film with Michelle Cuyate and Donna Gelati. And I wrote the script before The Fighter, and I couldn't get it made. And uh, Sidney said to me, he thought, David, because of your personal experience, you might have the tone to touch on such uncomfortable material, yet also find the heart and the humor in it, uh, and to balance it. And the book was more severe. I have to write and direct what I love. And I was unable to write, that's just not me, to have it be as harsh as that was. Um, it may be real, and that could be for another filmmaker. I thought Bob struggled the way we felt uh, he struggled in his way, that he had his own bipolar and OCD. Uh, and he was, it was the, co the pot calling the kettle black, and the sun could turn it around on him, you know? But yeah, it was different from Matthew Quick's book. But Matthew Quick's book was so helpful because we took many things from the book. You know, uh, Tiffany's behavior, losing her job because of her acting out, because of her grief with promiscuity, that was all from the book. And uh, it, it was a slow process to turn her into who she became. We did, a, we did a screen test with Jennifer where she was super goth, and she had black nail polish on like you did, which I think, she, and she had black eyeliner, and, and the studio just hated it. Uh, but we kind of loved it. And she still retained some of that in her character uh, after the test. Uh, what else? The best friend I loved, Ronnie. I love that the normal people, you know, you go to the normal people's house and they brag about all their stuff, which happened to me when I was a broke writer. And I'm like, you're bragging to the wrong person. You shouldn't brag to somebody who has nothing. You know, they could, couldn't wait to show off all their stuff, my friends. And, um, and, uh, and then he's the one who confides in him. He says, I'm not okay. Don't tell anybody. I'm not okay. I feel like I'm suffocating. <laughs> he says, but that's okay. You can't be happy. And I love that the guy who just got out of the hospital is going, who told you that? Who told you you can't be happy? That's not cool. But I, love, I love that the roles are reversed. Um, um, Her leaving the dinner party was always in the book. But you had, even before... And the location, sorry, Roger, to have a community be a character in a movie is also such a great help. Right. 
because the fighter I just come off of, and, and Lowell, Massachusetts is, is a, such a big part of the story, and, and so we did it here. Bradley grew up very close to this neighborhood, Upper Darby, Lower Marion, Jenkinstown. They all have all those brick porches. Um, are there neighborhoods here that are very specific? Yeah. No, yeah? absolutely. Like yeah. they have a very specific identity? With yeah, we have the Melpas. The have, what? The what? We have, we have the west side, we have the east side. There are very specific neighborhoods, which actually you know, leads to my next question, the specificity of, of the characters and also the neighborhood, and also the, the fact that it's 2008, and you guys- We picked that season. Yeah, and tell us about the, the, you know, the, the thought of picking the 2008. I mean, it was a big economic turmoil in our country. And um, can you tell us the importance? Well, it was, it was useful because that was the year of the economic crash, as described in the big short. And it meant that people were broke and hurting. And it meant that Ronnie could say, my uncle lost his pension. And Pat could say, my father lost his pension. That's why he's bookmaking. You know, people had to look to desperate ways to make a de dollar. So it raised the stakes for everybody. Uh, it also allowed us to pick a season of the, f you know, I loved scouting this movie because every house we went to, I got a different Philadelphia Eagles story from that house. Because they are really serious there in that town. You know, like there are in a lot of communities. And they're a little crazy. Um, and you got great stories about the dads with the remotes and things you could and could not do on game days. and. Um, so we picked that season, which was a heartbreaker, but had that breakthrough where they beat the Cowboys. And it was really fun to build that for Paulie Herman and Bob De Niro, who had been in Goodfellas together and had worked with Martin Scorsese together, and are such authentic, Paulie Herman is so authentic, to have him open the movie saying, the Cowboys are America's team, um, and, and to have that really bother Bob. Um, Jay, there are so many wonderful things that pay off um, towards the end of the movie. I'm, I'm thinking about, like, in the dance sequence, the liftoff, that, that it pays off so beautifully because during the rehearsals, we see a little bit, you tease us with the lift as well. Um, you know, the letter uh, uh, where... where um, um, you know, Robert De Niro is is obsessing with the with the envelope, and then we because get because all of his betting is in very numbered envelopes. As a bookmaker, people get their cash in numbered envelopes. So the son took an envelope because you know you had to make everything was a big deal. Everything was life and death, right? When when Inaritu made Birdman, he said to me, "I'm going to make a comedy." I said, "You are going to make a comedy. All your films are so suffering." He said, he said, what do you advise me? I said, you have to treat everything, no matter how little, like it's World War II. Like it's really important. So the envelopes are so important. That's in, that, in your house when you grow up with certain things. The envelopes are so important. And the fact that he took one was a big deal to the father. And suddenly it meant that he was up to something. Mm -hmm. And we loved that it. it was like he walked everywhere. You know, he never got in a car once until the very end of the movie. He did because he had no license and no phone. Correct. And so he it's a movie about a letter. And as I was going into production, I remember thinking, Am I crazy? I mean, who, who writes letters anymore? A, a, a movie about a guy walking around with a letter and she's gonna go around the restraining order with the letter, and it will be their secret agreement. A very important deal that they make. Mm -hmm. I like the deal that they make to help each other. So Jay, building those moments for a payoff, was it, was it challenging? Was it fun for you to? Fun, oh yeah. You know, uh, it, I mean, you, they were in the script, and they were in the script to, a de, you know, to greater or lesser degrees. Certainly, the, uh, the, we had a lot of setup about the lift, uh, and uh, we, we, uh, well, it was very interesting. I was thinking about this in the car, uh, that that we previewed the the picture and and the when the the lift during the actual performance, 
was at a certain length, and we thought, mm, okay, and the audience went nuts, as you guys did, and then so the next preview we had, we said, well, let's put another second or two on it, and it got better, and then the, the third preview, we said, can, can we really go this far? So we, you know, a couple more seconds, and yes. So th that's the kind of discovery that, that we made. And we, we, it, we also discovered it didn't take much setup to make that pay off, probably because of the visual. You know, when the, the sort of, all you had to do was see it and you knew what was going on. So um, the three cuts in the rehearsal were just enough. But we only had 30 days to shoot the movie. You know, it was, not, it was a $20 million budget. Jay, Jay is such a tremendous editor who puts all of his heart and his intelligence and passion into it. He was a University of Michigan graduate. Yes, Jay Cassidy. And, uh, and he said when he told his parents, I love this story that I just heard 10 years deep with Jay, he said, I want to make funny movies, he told his parents. And this was such a funny movie. Now, what you have to calibrate is that exact rotation of rehearsals and how you'd never show what their exact dance will be. So it's an art. How do you show their rehearsals yet still surprise us when you finally see the final dance and not see any of the music until then? That's a surprise for the audience. But you see them rehearse a lot. And how much rehearsal was too much rehearsal? Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and also when, when Danny comes and, and sort of shows them how to do stuff, you don't quite know, you, you don't quite know how that's going to pay off because you, you never see them then rehearsing the things he taught them. So, I mean, that was, uh, uh, you know, a lot of fun. The, the actual dance itself was beautifully choreographed. Um, I mean, plus... M Mandy Moore, not the singer, the choreographer, what, who yeah, also did yeah, La La Land. Yeah, and, and she... Plus, the lighting uh, was... was uh, Ma Masa, Masa ya, Takayanagi, our, our yeah. DP. Yeah. I mean, he... He did, he did that magic. He set up these lights. It was... That it went off every time. That was timed to their yeah, dance. It, it, was, it was very tightly choreographed because it had to be repeated so many times. And uh, I mean, it was like in incredibly so that we we um, we could you know we could put all the takes together and they would be just right and beat you know one take to the other. It, it, um, uh, it was quite remarkable, and th and that was also I mean a lot to do with Bradley and, and Jennifer just in how th much rehearsal they put into that dance. Yeah, they did, they did like three weeks of dance rehearsal before production, in the lead up to production. Um, I, I want to, I, I hope you don't mind me, uh, you know, telling the audience your technique of rehearsal, and not rehearsal, but of shooting, where, you know, the, the, the DP lights up the room 360 and then the camera revolves on both directions or on the action, and David is 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 live with them, you know, chiming in um, and coaxing. And you do 20-minute long takes where you capture the action. And my question to Jay is, how is it from an editor to to have all this footage? and diving in and, and start editing this long amount of uh, footage that you have. I mean, it's a blessing. To, and it's mostly what, what you're describing is, is a, a process that David has you know, developed in order to get the actors to stop acting. And, and just be, and so consequently, there's there's you know very little time when they're off camera just feeding a line. It's they're they're, they're having to uh, uh, play against the actor, and they never know when the camera's going to swing over to them. And so the 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 re often repeated takes just. Uh, breaks them down a little bit. I, that's not even the right word. It no, what sort it means of, is they stay. Yeah. They, if you look at being on camera as being in the pool mm -hmm. and staying in character, okay. as opposed to I prepared something, I did it, 
and now I'm done. Yeah. No, they're just in the pool. In the pool. I'm like, just live in the pool. Yeah. Right? So just live like you're on camera the whole time, which means they start living in the scene more. Yeah. And they, and they drop away any affectations, mm -hmm. and it starts just becoming this thing that's living. And you, you can see it happen. You know, you, you know, in a, in a long take, you can just see it happen, and so that that t and so when you when you've seen it happen, you know what choices to make in terms of the editing. And Jay, you hear in the you hear him commenting, uh, urging the actors, etc. You hear his commentary. Is that helpful to you in the editing process? Um. In so far as it um, it helps the actors, it's helpful, you know. And it's it, it's I mean it's they're, they're not this, this these aren't improvisations that's going on. It's it's uh, you know things that are scripted, and uh, uh, and then David will you know f force a reset, and the reset is what makes them have to sort of break down. Is that that's fair to say? You know, they, yeah, not break down. Break, they, they, yeah, they, the they, forget, they forget. They forget themselves. Yeah. So they get lost in the scene. Yes. And yes. it's like a band. They're like they become like a band playing music. It's like Bob and Jackie and Shea Wiggum and John Ortiz yeah. and and uh, Anupam Kar, who's done 400 movies in India. That's how many movies they make in India. Yeah. He's been in 400 movies. Mm -hmm. Anupam Kar. So they're all there, and they they forget. They're just in this rhythm like a band. Yeah. And the thing keeps going, and I just say, I just say, do it again, and we just keep doing it, and it gets looser and it gets more alive. Um, Jay happened to win. I want to point out the Editors Guild Award for this film. All right. And, and, Thank you. Yeah. And I'm also happy to say that he also won it the following year, which is virtually unprecedented. American Hustle. Yes, for American yeah. Hustle. Yeah. So I'm very happy. I'm very, I'm very lucky to work with Jay. I'm very fortunate. Thank you. Because just like you, he's all heart and soul. You know, and you can't, you can't, decide, once you find that, you're very fortunate. Well, thank you. Um, um, Jay, I want to ask you about the phone sequence where Bradley is fighting with his mom and it escalates. Um, it's such an intense scene and so beautifully edited. Was that a, a, a difficult scene for you to edit? <laughs> Difficult, yes. I mean, here again, it was part of our calibration. How far, how, how how far do they go? How angry does he get? And there there were there were great ranges in the takes, and we had to we had to find something that was true, and um, uh, also didn't also that kind of the the characters didn't say something that they could never get come back from. You know what I mean? That, that there, there's those three characters loved each other, and the degree to which you know they were willing to say things, they risked hurting hurting the other person, and they knew it. And and that kind of guided us because they, you know even though they were arguing, you know they they were not um, they 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 knew they kind of their sub their subconscious knew they couldn't totally hurt the other person. They couldn't say that thing that would would undo it all, that you'd never come back from. And were, were you guys, David and Jay, were you always in agreement about what scenes should be in, what scenes shouldn't be out? Be... What, I, I have to oh, answer. No, 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 you should say it. It's funny, it's fun. Or do you want to yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, I'll take a point of view and then Two days later, I'm saying, you know, maybe I'm not really right about that, but he's adopted the same point of view, so... I say, Jay, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. And Jay says, I don't think that anymore. Yeah. I agree with you. So we, so we, so, so we switch positions. Just, yeah. But it's a great process. You know, it means you really get to... It's like, it's like washing a car really good. You know, like you, you go through the process of like, no, I fought for it this way, and then I fought for it that way, and then we finally decided together... Uh, what was just the right way. And that fight was quite a fight. Like, and the kid who comes to the door, you know, and asks right. if they're having, and the, the neighborhood, the eyes of the neighborhood, there's so much shame associated with having problems in your house and being on the lawn in your pajamas at two in the morning with blood, you know, and, uh, and anybody who's been there knows, you know, and, uh, and that's why the compassion means so much. 
Uh, but I, I loved watching that scene. And that was my son who played the guy who rang the doorbell. And it was great for him to be the one on the outside of it, because he w had used to be the one on the inside of it. And so for him to be ringing the doorbell, and then when Bob was coming at him, chasing him, my son, who was like 16, was freaking out, you know, because he, he, he said it was like being in Raging Bull, you know? And, and he started laughing so nervously, and I said, no, no, you can't laugh, you can't. And Bob goes, no, it's okay, it's okay, I can make it work. And he goes, and he's right yelling, he goes, da, 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 what are you laughing at? And, and it works perfectly, what are you laughing at? He goes, I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry. And then he goes, what are you laughing at? I'm sorry, goodbye. He made it work perfectly, it was great. Be, and because of him, you were invested in this film, correct? Because of your son. And I remember, um, if I co yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, you mentioned to me 10 years ago a story that you made your son and his friends read you the script all uh, summer. All summer. Yeah. Um, can you tell well, because they were teenagers who were you know and they all went to a, a school together for kids who had emotional challenges or cognitive challenges and they i was glad they had each other they were friends but they could go off the rails they could become very unruly like any teenager or even more so so i used it as this thing to make them work and to help me so i said you guys have to read the script out loud to me every day so they would read the script out loud to me and it was very helpful to me to edit the script and it was kept them out of trouble and um, gave them a task. And then they all came to the, the set and they got to be in the Halloween scene when they're all yelling. And, and one of those boys, I'm very sorry to say, it was very sweet, didn't make it. You know, you end up with the wrong people and um, he snorted fentanyl, you know, which is killing a lot of young people. And he died very close to our edit room, which is a great loss. And uh, he was a very sweet kid. And, and he was in that scene. And at the table read, Table reads are notoriously weird for me. You read the whole movie with the cast and the studio, and they often feel awkward. And uh, we did the table read, and this beautiful kid, Elias, was there with my son, and he's Asperger's, so he's a little different. And the table read ends, and there's this awkward silence. And the silence is broken by Elias, who goes, well, we have a script. <laughs> And it just, everybody laughed so hard. And then he goes, now, can I ask a question? Is this actually what the movie's gonna be, like this? Which was on everybody's mind, including the studio. Because every time you have a table you read, you're kind of thinking, half of you's like, oh shit, what have I gotten myself into? Everybody thinks that, it's like pregame jitters, to some degree. Like the table read for American Hustle kind of was like, it was like it went sideways into like a, Jeremy Renner and Christian Bale started having a debate over whether they would ever get physically into a fight, which is in the movie, and it like went on for like four hours and it just spread sideways. And you, just, you leave thinking, good God, but it's, it's great. That's what makes creative work exciting. <laughs> it's, 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 you, don't know. Um, you, I mean, this was 10 years ago. Now Bradley Cooper has been nominated a plethora of times as best actor, but you reintroduced us to Bradley Cooper as a serious actor. Um, you, know, you know, tell us what you saw in him 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, that, that it, we see now on the, on the screen, you know, this incredible actor who taps into his anger uh, powerfully on screen. What was it about him that, that caught your eye? Uh, this is what Guillermo del Toro says also about his casting. It's all in the eyes. And you look in someone's eyes and you can see all the dimensions, all the heartbreak, all the yearning, the vulnerability, the craziness, if they're not masked. And Bradley was not masked. Bradley had become sober and he was very vulnerable. And I said, I saw you in in that movie Wedding Crashers and you were scary, you know, you were big and you were scary and you were angry and he said to me, very, I said, you seem to me like you were frightening in real life. And he was, his answer was very vulnerable and honest. He said, I was very unhappy. I was 30 pounds overweight and I was an addict. And I was angry, but I was hiding behind my anger. I was very frightened and very vulnerable. 
And that made me love him. It meant that he was willing to be open about being a vulnerable person and about struggling, you know? And he was not afraid to go there with me. And he's a very loving person also. So he, he, and, he, and so he was a great person to have on the set because he wants everybody to do better. And Jennifer had not come out in Hunger Games. We just knew her from Winter's Bone. And she, she sat here with us, right, Roger? In, in yeah, this theater, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 20, and, 10 years ago. And she sang to me in the dark coming down the stairs. This is such a beautiful theater. Um, I'll never forget it, coming down the stairs with her in the dark. And she went, David. And, she was, and uh, her first scene is when she came, she comes running into the movie and says, I can't do it, I can't do the letter. That was her first day on set. And we looked at each other and we said, wow. And the first day we, I met him, we came back and looked at Daly's and he came in and he said, Bradley Cooper is going to be a force here. And he said, this one, Jennifer, what was your term? I don't this, this one's been... Kissed by the angels or something, you said? Probably, yeah. yeah. Like, she had some magic about her at that time. She was very pure. She had a magic about her. She still is. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, Bradley, you mentioned, was very much involved in post-production. He was executive producer. He was there with you editing. Can you tell us about, about and that? They made A Star is Born Together. A yeah. Star is Born Together as well. Um, Tell us about having Bradley in in the editing room with you. Uh, well, I mean, he he's very smart in the you, you know he he had been in editing rooms uh, you know from his early TV days. He was interested in it, and clearly his ambition was to be a, a director. And he um, so he was not. He knew what was going on. He wasn't walking in um, as a as a kind of a neophyte to the process. And you know, he, he his uh, sort of truthometer is high, and and that was very helpful. And you know, in those situations, it's it's nice to um, have the circle grow amongst trusted collaborators. And already. There, there, the, your collaboration with him was very advanced, and and that, that, um, th and I, you know, there's a, there's a big generosity in a director allowing an actor into the process because you know the the, the you know it's a as you say very vulnerable for the actor, and uh, uh, you know it it's. You know, but Bradley, he he could just turn himself off, is in terms of that's Pat and I'm me, and 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 really be hard on on himself, on us, on the cut, uh, you know, and and that's a great force to have around, and um, and he he you know his interest was not a couple of afternoons, his interest was weeks, and he then he would go do another movie, and so we would have him on the FaceTime for hours, and he would just, he'd be half asleep in Croatia, and uh, um, uh, watching the little TV of what we, you know, we'd face the FaceTime right to the screen, and he'd, he'd be watching, and you know, the, that that kind of that dedication, we all grew to respect, and um, and then you know his he had some perspective on it that that just made the 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 kind of you know people in a room trying to make decisions. It just added a layer to it, which was very rich. He's also an enthusiast, so he keeps the energy very enthusiastic. Oh, yeah, yes. And, and, and I remember we would first invited a first group of people to come in, and he invited some friends in of his. <laughs> yeah. and, and they didn't know he was there listening through a crack in the door, and they were brutal on him. Mm -hmm. And then we laughed about it so hard. I just remember thinking, wow, those are your friends? <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to uh, Jennifer Lawrence, she was, she was late to a... To a, in the auditioning process? Yes, she was the last person. Man, many wonderful actresses worked a lot with me in the auditioning process many times. And I was very close to casting uh, one or two. And then she was the last person to audition via Skype 
from her family's home in Louisville, mm -hmm. Kentucky. And she went from being the, the you know, the, uh, what do you call it? Um, the dark horse yeah. to be cast to... Oh, just, she just immediately went to the... There was just something very special about her. And, and, I, and I remember going to show the studio head that, and they were very convinced we were going to use somebody else or work with someone else. And I, I just said, they looked 30 seconds of it, and they just said, oh, my God. Just because she just, she just poured through her eyes. She just poured her soul right into the thing, you know. And uh, she also, there was some weird thing that happened with a big spider in the bathroom behind her while, during the audition which also became part of the magic, weirdly. Because it was like she was being really serious and crying, with the, and then all of a sudden she was like, oh my God, holy shit, and she was killing this giant spider in the background. And I thought, wow, that's the character, that's great. Yeah. It's yeah. very Annie Hall. That's crazy. Um, when, you know, you've worked with her with so many, in so many, uh, you know, movies, there's this incredible emotional maturity in her. There's a confidence but at the same time, this, this vulnerability where, you know, is that something that you and her developed but it, or it was there all along? I think if you're able to trust each other and you really like each other, you can go farther. It brings out the best of each of you. Mm -hmm. Put it that way, right? It may be in each of us, but you, you can go farther. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that best part of you can come out and shine more than it might under other circumstances. Uh, she just threw herself into American Hustle, you know, fearlessly. Completely different role, mm -hmm. you know. And she, and uh, uh, just very special privilege to work with all those actors. And John Ortiz, I love so much. I love when he gives them the and and Shea Wiggum, uh, Dash Mihawk. Uh, Julia Stiles, um, yeah. yeah, what a cast. Jackie Weaver. Jackie Weaver, yeah. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the, the tone, in your, I, in your writing, David, there is a rhythm to, yeah. to the way they talk. Um, is that something that was already built into the script or that you develop with the, with the actor? I mean, particularly when I watch Silver Linings, the rhythm of Robert De Niro is so beautiful, but it sounds like you. It's like I've never heard Robert De Niro speak in the way he speaks in this film. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Uh, yeah, you, you find your voice, you find your rhythm. Scorsese teaches that when you watch films and you see what you're drawn to, that helps you understand who you are as a person and as a creator. What you're, what you're attracted to, what you love in other films, right? Mm -hmm. So over the t years of writing and what I loved in films, this rhythm became something that I loved very much, which was probably born in my house from my relatives and me, and it became a rhythm that this is the rhythm of how the words have to be said, and this is the rhythm of how the scene goes. It's like, again, like music. It is like music. Mm -hmm. And it helps you, even when Pat would go running, I would tell him, this is the rhythm that's in your head of how you're feeling right now. And it would be like a drum rhythm of how he felt, how he felt, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody gets the rhythm. And then I'm blessed to have people like Bob then love that rhythm, and they always want to find it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I answered your question. No, 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 yeah. you, you did. And you mentioned that you love other movies. And what were the movies that influenced your take on Silver Linings? I can't help to think about Frank Capra and the fact that most people think that Frank Capra is this sweet, you know, loving man, but there's actually a lot of anger and a lot of danger in some of his films. What other films? What I do love about this film, watching it, tonight is that it, it does, it, it's a little like one of Capra, like, like It's a Wonderful Life, in terms of that it has a lot of emotion going on the whole time. And, and it ends up with a kind of a happiness, you know, a hard-won happiness for the moment, for the moment. And, and that, if you like that kind of thing, which I do, um, I can't seem to commit to a dark ending. Um, that's, many of other filmmakers are very good at that. 
And uh, uh, I liked Capra. I liked uh, Cuckoo's Nest with, with uh, Milos Forman and Jack Nicholson and Louise Fletcher. Uh, and I very much liked um, Ray Milland and The Lost Weekend. Uh, and I also very much liked Raging Bull, uh, which could be considered to be a mental health movie. And I loved his conversations with his brother in the first half of the movie. Uh, very much. And Taxi Driver is also like a mental health movie, strangely enough. And um, Sally Field made a made-for-television movie called Maybe I'll Come Home in the Spring, which was directed by Joseph Sargent, which blew my mind when I was like a teenager. And she, it's about a runaway in Los Angeles who comes home. And you see her, her view of her life in her home that's supposed to be normal. Mm -hmm. And it's and you see where the heartbreak is and how it's where there's no love or that where there's people somehow missing life. Right? So things like that had a big impact on me. Um, Jay, one of the things I, in, I mentioned to you earlier that I teach and I've taught this film and one of the things I love about it is that the tone and the genre is, you know, some people try to pigeonhole it into a romantic comedy and I say you're doing it disservice by calling it a romantic comedy. There is so so much in this film. How how was your approach as you were editing about about the genre of the film and the you tone? Know, you know you 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 don't think about the genre like at that time and the tone you, you know, you let emerge from the material. I think that's the best way to to, to approach it because you you don't want to be imposing a tone on 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 the material. You want the material to tell you what it is, and um, so that uh, you, you know. And that's certainly in the writing and. In the in in the the uh, uh, performances, so um, it's it's kind of like at the end I look back and said, oh, I see what the tone of this was. But when you're doing it, you're not you're not asking yourself that question because it's it's not relevant. Kind of when you're doing it, it's only relevant when you stand back and you watch the whole thing and you you see it you see it the kind of the rhythms go from one thing to another. See how people say that, and that, and that I never thought of it as that. Yeah, I was shocked. I was shocked when people right. said that. But of course, I look and I go, "Oh yeah, okay, I can see how you could say that," from a different point of view. Yeah, right. And I go, "Oh, okay, that was never how I saw it. I, I just always saw it as this personal experience of this guy getting out of this hospital, mm -hmm. and and the comedy comes not from trying to be funny, yeah. but from being super committed mm -hmm. to everything they're doing. So then he's in the car with with Chris Tucker." You know, and he t takes the wheel from his mother, and uh, they have that whole moment. Which, yeah. by the way, I wanted to ask you, I've always loved the Chris Tucker character. It seems that he's always waiting in the wings, and mm -hmm. he's like, you know, you know, and he just pops in throughout the story. How did you, was that planned in the script, the, yeah. the, that he's off stage and he just walks in throughout? Well, he's a, he's, a, he's a doppelganger. He's the, he's the reminder that this man was just in a, committed to a, legally in court to a hospital, mm -hmm. a mental hospital. And he's this friend from the mental hospital who is trying to deal with the legalities of getting himself out. Mm -hmm. And he knows every letter, that is the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania law that he is saying. Mm -hmm. That if you, that the half the length of your felony sentence, all that stuff that he was parsing is real. <laughs> That, that's all the real law that he was saying. And, and so, like a lot of patients, you know, he was on the line where he felt like, no, I'm just, I'm just a, I'm, they're, they're giving me a bad break with the law. I need to be out of here. Mm -hmm. So, and that's part of the thing about mental illness. Someone can seem so terrifically regular and you don't have any idea how much of a struggle they're going through. Uh, or as Camus said, people have no idea how much many people struggle to be normal or seem normal. I have... I'm so glad you brought up Camus. I have so many people during the pandemic and the lockdown that told me the film that they gravitated towards was Silver Linings Playbook. Did you, you didn't hear that? Because of the, there was, there was this sense of optimism, yeah. you know, despite 
you know, turmoil and the family nucleus. Yeah, no, I had a lot of people that said that was the film that gave them hope. And yes, good. I, the, the best compliment I ever got about this film was from, a, a, I did a, like a thing at USC about the film and the, 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 one of the students said, it's so great to spend time with a couple of broken people. Mm. That's beautiful. No, I mean, it's a very believable, specific world that is eccentric and that's it's how our lives are you know it's we're all eccentric and we're all have you know uh deficiencies or whatever you know uh, but we're it's a it's a it's a very it, it's a beautiful film i just adore it i'm going to i will never forget seeing it for the first time at the toronto film festival it was a packed and everybody who was there was stunned about what they were seeing. Can you, from your vantage point, was that the first time you were seeing it with a crowd? No, we had previewed it a couple times, but that was a 2,000 seat theater. How many seats are in this theater? This is 2,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so that was an explosive reaction. At that, at that, at that screening, I and never it, experienced yeah. anything like. Oh, it was electric, and it was so wonderful. It was just beautiful. I, I loved it so much. I loved it. It was a baptism of the film, you know, because you don't know what's going to happen with your film as it come, makes its way into the world, and it won the audience award at the Toronto Film Festival, and uh, yeah, I don't know what else I can tell you about it. Just that was a very special. But thing. was that? Was, yeah. Was it a shock to you, a, surpri a wonderful surprise to see how the film... It was a wonderful surprise to see how explosive the reaction was, uh, that how much it was embraced, because um, you don't, you don't, we didn't expect it. And that was the first time I had experienced that in a house that big. And why, what, after 10 years, what do you think is the appeal of the film to people? I loved watching it right now. I mean, I was standing over there and I was crying and I was laughing. I was laughing, and, I, and, I, and I'm very, I'm very, I'm, thank you guys. I'm, I was sitting there thinking, God, I really love this film, and I texted Jennifer, I taped the ending, and I texted it to Jennifer and Bradley, and I said, I'm thinking of you guys, and I love you guys, and they're celebrating the 10th anniversary here, um, and uh, we're thinking of you, you know? Aww. Yeah. It just, it just, it just, it just can't, it was just meant to be, all those forces we've talked about, Roger. You know, the, the, the book, my own experience, personalizing it, working with Jay and, and Bradley, being kind of a family for the movie, you know, together. And uh, it just came out, it, was, it came out real nice, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, so it's a, that's a nice thing to feel. It's a nice thing to look at and feel. And Jay, do you have any yeah. perspective about its appeal and its endurance? I, you know, the, 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 the fact that, that this this audience responded the way it did, you know. Ten years later, is, I mean that that's astounding because we're we, we're in such a disposable kind of world of of media that that you know something's got to have real heart and real kind of a, a, a truth in it that that people keep responding year after year. So I, I'm. Humbled. And you have a, a film coming this coming fall, correct? Yes, in November. Yes, we have a film with uh, Christian Bale, Margot Robbie, John David Washington, Robert De Niro, Rami Malek, Anya Taylor Joy, Chris Rock, yeah, Mike Myers, Mike, You're Michael Shannon. Are you happy about the process? So yeah. far? We're loving it, yes. Yeah. We're blessed to be making movies and blessed to be in our editing room. We live in the ocean of cinema and to be making I'm so happy to be working with Jay. Feelings mutual. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Sometimes you don't have that. <laughs> you know? it's, so you're, you're it's lucky. It's hard enough to make a movie yes. than to be yes. with people who are not passionate about it yes it's it you just think like well why do it if you you know mm. it's like 
the older you get and the, the grayer the hair goes, the, the less you want to do it except on that which involves you totally as a, as a person working on the film. Anything else, it's just not worth it. This is an extremely passionate man who will get up and argue like you're talking about a life and death matter, and you want someone like that. But, but it is life and death. Yes, there you because go. The, yes, there ten you years go. later, the audience <laughs> tells you, and if, if, if it doesn't have the truth and it isn't, you, you know, they will, this wouldn't occur. You wouldn't, this film you, you have to You have to bleed for it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and, or a lot. And what's beautiful is, you know, Jay is such a force. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the charming things and funny things that Bradley and I will always cherish is that we would try to do things in the film and Jay would sometimes disagree with us very intensely. And, um, and he would sort of scold us. And we would sit on a couch like this and Jay would be back at the avenue and we'd be looking at each other like, oh, shit, no. And, and we just go, oh, Jay, Jay, we just got to, okay, all right, Jay. You know, and, and it was just a wonderful thing for Bradley. It was a loving thing for us to share that we would just go, okay. And then, and then we'd go, well, Jay, can we try it anyway? He'd go, well, of course. <laughs> but, but it was just a wonderful part of the process. We knew that there was a very strong argument in another way. So nothing comes easy. You have to earn it. Yeah. yeah. But as you say, it, you, every decision you make in a, when you're making the film is, is life and death. Care that much you is have, really good. It, it to not to be, be cynical. Because you had like, or, or nothing lives, you know, nothing, it, it just becomes another piece of forgettable stuff. Well, thank you to the two of you for being here. We love this film. Yeah. Kudos. Thank, thank you for having us, Roger. This was a real treat for us. Oh, it was a are real you treat kidding? For us. Are you kidding me? It's amazing. You know that um, the last film we showed in February 2020 was the 25th anniversary of... of, of uh, yeah, Three Kings. Oh, my God. And... I'm the anniversary guy. I, you're the... This, no, this, you're the... This, you're the bookend. The I'm the bookends of the pandemic. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, that's actually one of the reasons when, when you approached me about doing this screening, I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> we the la literally, the last screening we did, um, uh, February 2020, was the 25th anniversary of Three Kings. And then here we are, the 10th anniversary. I just want to say again, and I'm not being in any way gratuitous, it's very special, the film community here. And it's very special that we can drive from Los Angeles to come to this place where people love cinema and come out and love to see it and how it's curated by you. That's special. I mean, it's really special. I mean, it would be a tremendous absence if we didn't have it. Well, it's no, very no, sweet. No, really. No, yeah. it's true. It's we great... love you. No, no, because where, where are we going to go, right? You have to go somewhere. When I was a young filmmaker, where was I going to go? I was going to go to Sundance. At, you have to aim your, right? You have to go somewhere. So I was taking my films to Sundance. Where are we going to go now? We have to come here. Well, and we have to show it to audiences here. That's what we love to do. Well, you're, you're very, very kind. I'm going to use this clip of you talking, promoting our <laughs> festival with that. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Roger. Thank you, thank we you love guys. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.